Well, good morning, everyone. I'm uh, Dave Deptula, Dean of the Mitchell Institute for Aerospace Studies. And today we're pleased to host the commander of Pacific Air Forces, General Ken Wilsbach. Now, Cruiser, last time with, we had you on, uh, Russia had just invaded Ukraine. Yes. And while we know that that is still huge at the top of the interest list, our pacing threat is still China. And you're the commander of our air forces over here, over there, that are right in the middle of dealing with the pacing threat. Um, so our audience obviously is very interested today uh, to hear about your thoughts with respect to what you're doing uh, to improve readiness, uh, everything that we've heard about the agile combat employment concept, right. uh, what's going on. So we really appreciate you taking the time to come and visit us. Uh, and with that, what I'd like to do is kind of hand it over to you for a bit of remarks, overarching, and then we'll jump into Q&A on specifics. So, great. Over well, to you. Thanks, General Deptulis. It's fantastic to be here again. And uh, thanks to all the people that are uh, joining over the web and, and uh, watching the broadcast. Um, I'll just start with the objectives for the United States and the Indo-Pacific haven't changed. It's still a free and open Indo-Pacific. And we're primarily executing that uh, through integrated deterrence. And what I thought I might do, because everybody throws that term around a lot, and maybe right. we don't break it down so much. And maybe we can break it down. And we'll, let me talk about integrated first, and then the deterrence aspect of it second. But uh, integrated means a whole of government, and then also um, incorporating allies and partners. And so it's not just a DOD thing. It, it needs to incorporate other parts of the government, like um, Treasury and the FBI. An example, the FBI is doing some really good work uh, against uh, cyber, uh, cyber actors from uh, the PRC uh, that are doing illegal things in our country, like stealing technology. Uh, and uh, Treasury did some fantastic work against Russia. Um, that's, so, so it's a whole of government aspect um, it's part of integrated. And then bringing in allies and partners, it's so important. That's so important um, as a part of our strategy because China would love for it to be the U.S. and China only. But in fact, it's China versus the U.S. and our allies and partners because um, most of the countries, almost all of the countries in the Indo-Pacific and many from Europe want a free and open Indo-Pacific as well. And they're interested in linking up with us and, uh, and, and doing strategy on their own to try to ensure that there's um, a free and open Indo-Pacific. And so the integrated and uh, as far as a whole of government and allies and partners, very important. Now the deterrence piece, what, what does that mean? Well, um, there's probably three aspects at least of deterrence. One is cost imposition, denial of benefits, and then resiliency. And so from the standpoint of deterrence, much of that falls on uh, DOD, and the way that we're, in, we're executing that these days is, again, uh, with our allies and partners, but also uh, from the standpoint of the joint force. And so I've said many times this past year that the Indo-Pacific has never been more joint. And in fact, I can confidently say there's something happening right now as we speak that's joint um, from the standpoint of mil military activities, because we plan and execute the military activities now beginning as a joint effort. And so in, in, in past years, oftentimes we would plan separately and then we would execute and they happen to be same day and we would say it's joint, but really it wasn't integrated as a joint operation, but today it is. And so that's, um, that's fantastic. And then uh, the operations with our allies and partners is incredibly important. In fact, uh, just, uh, just, um, uh, earlier, a few weeks ago, we finished uh, Cope North, which was an exercise um, in the Guam area. It actually happened on uh, seven uh, different islands, uh, 10 different air bases um, with the U.S., uh, not just Air Force, but Marines and uh, Navy as well, um, along with the French, along with the Australians and the Japanese, um, all executing agile combat employment. And um, it was a fantastic exercise, about 2,000 uh, total personnel, about 1,200 
uh, sorties with a um, hundred different aircraft from all those countries. And so um, bringing in the allies and partners as a, as a part of the deterrence is, is so important. Let me just stop there and it'll be sure. really fun to get to the question. Yeah, let me, uh, uh, if I may, just segue to something that you said. It reminded me of uh, a, a good friend of mine, a former uh, CNO, uh, Gary Ruffhead, many, many years ago, uh, talked about a thousand ship Navy. Right. And his idea was if you incorporate allies and partners, uh, you have the equivalent of that size. Um, when you think about allied and partner air power, um, not necessarily in quantity, but in terms of the way you think of our partners and allies, is that the kind of thing that, that you all plan for is the potential use of uh, allied air power uh, in conjunction with U.S. capabilities when doing contingency planning? I would say yes, and uh, the, the first aspect of that is just having opportunities to train with one another, um, which uh, starts with exercises. Oftentimes, it includes subject matter experts just to share share ideas, and of course, in our region, we have a number of allies and partners that share equipment like Japan and Australia and Korea with the F-35 uh, and a number of other other types of very modern capabilities. You know, soon um, not only will Australia have the E seven, but so will we. Um, and so we've we will learn an immense amount from the Australians on how to fly the E seven. We already really have because we've been flying with it for a few several years right. now. Anyway, um, but um, they will obviously help us field the E seven, and we'll take advantage of what they've learned over the years. And and by the way. So will the UK uh, when the RAF gets the E7. And so this sharing of um, tactics, techniques, and procedures between the, the allies and partners uh, only makes us strong. And then exercising uh, on you know, a very frequent basis helps us to be interoperable. And it makes sense that the U.S. trains with Australia and Japan and, and uh, Korea as our allied partners, but we're branching it out and we're trying to incorporate even more of the allies and partners who also share free and open Indo-Pacific as their goal and, uh, you know, countries that may, maybe aren't the, the common countries that we fly with, they're becoming more common. Um, you know, examples, you know, all the way in the, the western part of our AOR with India. Uh, and uh, and others, um, we're hopeful this year we'll get some uh, right. great training with India at Cope India this year. So there there's a lot to be said for um, frequent training to achieve that interoperability. Yeah, and that's great to hear that um, exercises like Cope North and. I'm dating myself a bit, but I was in the first F-15 deployment out of Kadena back in 1979 to go to Cope North and new to Peru, Japan. Mm -hmm. But that was like six Eagles, and uh, they were still flying F-104s at the time. So it's great to hear how Cope North is still around, but it's really, really expanded. Yes. Uh, so that's super. Now, uh, another question that lots of folks are are concerned about is the fact that the Air Force is undersized because its modernization was delayed for so long. And I, I won't dwell on that, but we're even getting smaller as a result. Um, so that means you might not have the mix of capabilities and capacity uh, necessary to generate the combat power uh, to deal with the uh, potential contingencies. The gap was sort of became evident when we're given up on uh, not not giving up, but being forced to retire permanent presence, those F-15s on Kadena, that kind of showed up and is some evidence. So the question's, how are you planning on dealing with this challenge of capacity? And uh, I, I know this is not a budget question, but if you had another dollar, where would you spend that capa that that resource to in order to gain either capacity or capability? Yeah, let me answer the first part, uh, the the second part of your question first, uh, which is where, where would I spend the next dollar? And 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 the good news is that the upcoming budget looks like it's going to address some of this, and there's certainly more to do. 
Um, but air superiority is the area that um, I would spend the next dollar. And it starts with the E7, as I mentioned before, but having domain awareness is important. And why we need the E7 so badly is because our current fleet of E3s are challenged remarkably with just getting them in the air. There are very old airframes and our maintainers are, are doing great work to, to keep those things in flying order, but they're old and they take a lot of maintenance to keep them uh, in operable condition. And then the, the other fact is even when they're perfectly in order and they get airborne, um, they don't necessarily see what they need to see in the 21st century modern warfare, the E7 does. Uh, and so the, the E7 will allow us to complete a much longer kill chain that will be required uh, for that fight. So the E7 is you know, absolutely critical. Uh, the next aspect would be the, uh, the next generation air dominance family of systems um, so that uh, we re-achieve a significant advantage in the, in the air to air fight. Um, and then associated fifth and sixth generation weapons um, so that um, we're not um, basically at parity with the threat, but rather we have an advantage. And so we're looking for um, better air-to-air -air weapons. And then one thing that people often don't think about with respect to air superiority is um, weapons to be able to kill ships. And because of the way that our uh, adversary thinks about um, anti-access area denial, they're going to put ships out probably um, to the east of Taiwan and those ships put up an anti-access area denial in you know weapons engagement zone that comes from the missiles that they have on the ships, and when they take away that airspace, it it takes away our ability to have freedom of maneuver and to create effects via air power until you can attrit those ships. And so, a part of air superiority will be being able to attrit those ships. And so, I we need better and more weapons to attrit the ships. Uh, from the standpoint of the first part of the question that you asked, which is what are we doing with the with the current force structure and our capabilities uh, to be able to be prepared? And I, I will tell you that our folks are training incredibly hard every single day and um, weapons officers in the squadron tweaking every single day the capabilities of every member of the squadron, not just the ones who are out in the air, but including um, the maintainers and the controllers and uh, weapons loaders and, and all, all aspects of getting air power in the air and creating air power effects. Um, and so we, and, and we're, and I'll tell you, we're ready. And our folks, um, it, even in the year, um, in the last year, I've seen a significant improvement in our ability uh, to counter the toughest th threats that we face. And, you know, a year ago when we, we would do a red flag and it wouldn't come out so great, this year they're, they're doing a lot better. And so the, the folks at the weapons school at Nellis, at the Warfare Center at Nellis, um, along with every single weapons officer in the Pacific have improved their tactics uh, techniques and procedures to be able to succeed in a really complicated, tough fight. That's great to hear. And, I, you know, as you're talking, I'm thinking about um, uh, the kinds of issues that uh, we had to face back in the day. And there's so much more advanced and complex today. Uh, and as you mentioned, our uh, uh, our airmen and everyone part of the Air Force Enterprise uh, is pedaling as fast as they can uh, and doing as as best they can. Um, let me segue just a bit uh, on something you already alluded to. You talked about the importance of E7 in providing information uh, against modern threats. Um, we hear it, those of us who've been associated with the Pacific for decades, you know, about the tyranny of distance, mm -hmm. 16 time zones. That obviously expands uh, the length of time and distance uh, that aircraft uh, have to travel. You talked about AWACS a bit, but how else does this time dimension or distance dimension um, affect missions like uh, airlift and other ISR aspects? So the tyranny of distance applies to 
everybody that requires fuel <laughs> to get somewhere. So right. fuel is the most important aspect. And of course, access basing and overflight to um, have bases, um, not only in territory that we own uh, in the United States, but our, our friends and allies to allow us uh, the use of their airfields um, to either um, base or even just to stop and uh, get some gas and maybe some weapons. And so that that is all um, incredibly important. So not just for uh, mobility, um, but also, as you mentioned, ISR, but um, the bombers and the fighters and everybody else that has to traverse um, that expanded space you know, you know, knows the tyranny of distance as you do. I will tell you that the partnership between Pacific Air Forces and Air Mobility Command is really strong. Uh, and General Minahan, uh, in fact, I, I joked a few few weeks ago that um, I'm starting to think that the the folks in Air Mobility Command want to switch patches because they're always at, at Hawaii planning with my staff and vice versa, by the way. So we've had uh, quite a bit of uh, crosstalk between our two commands to ensure that um, the mobility as well as the air refueling um, is in the right place so that we can execute the, the plan if we ever get called to do that. Very good. Um, one of the things that everyone uh, listening to this broadcast is familiar with is Secretary Kendall's operational imperatives. And here at Mitchell Institute, we're huge fans of all of those uh, because they're going to be crucial. Uh, but they're also long range solutions that won't execute missions for a while. Uh, so how do we employ what we've already got more effectively and imaginatively, if you will, to shore up, up some of our most pressing uh, capacity and capability gaps? Not what comes to mind, uh, I'll toss out the MQ-9 as an example. It's something that we have. It was a major player in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, but I, I do think its sensor shooter capabilities, if used in innovative ways, might make a difference in the Pacific, too. What are your thoughts? I totally agree with you. In fact, I'm a big fan of the MQ-9 uh, for a couple of reasons. Um, one, it's relatively inexpensive, and so you can afford to have a lot of them. And the new sensors and the pods that they're putting on the aircraft um, allow it to do a multitude of different missions, and they can be networked. And so if you imagine um, several MQ-9s flying in a region, and they're talking to, to one another, and they're linked into what we call the combined operating picture, the COP, um, and let's say one of them gets shot down, the network just closes and you keep the information flow and um, you you have information superiority. And so that, that aircraft allows you to do that. And with the numbers that you can have in flight at any given time, um, you, can, you can really have, um, you can close the gaps in, in your information gaps and in what you can and cannot see. And so that I, I'm, I'm a big fan of that, that aircraft, but expanding it, you know, more broadly to the, to the, um, to the gist of your question, which is how, how do we use what we already have to improve? And um, this is one of the strengths of America and especially um, the, the um, you know, American military members, because we want them to be innovative and we allow them to be innovative. And um, they come up with innovations that uh, give even no new kit, um, just what they have, and they come up with new way, new and better ways of putting it together. But I do think this this aspect of networking, and we call it stacking of effects, and synchronizing that. Uh, today's young people that are leading, you know, leading at the tactical level, they know how to do this, and they bring in space effects and cyber, and they they um, join up with their. Uh, partners from the joint force and bring in maritime and, and sometimes even uh, army and uh, Marine Corps capabilities. And they put them all together and synchronize them in time and space uh, to create the kind of effects that we want. And they're really good at it and they've grown up that way. And so um, I'm very confident. And then the last aspect of this is as we look to industry, again, American industry is um, is incredibly innovative and um, they can deliver quick wins for us um, that um, we're seeing across the force um, that allows us to use what we already have um, in a better way. Awesome. Um, 
Let's switch gears a little bit and uh, talk about threat capabilities. Uh, the J-20 is an aircraft that's been around for a while, but now it's coming out and some might say proliferating to a degree that they're a lot more visible and they're operating more and more in closer proximity to um, our aircraft. So could you comment a little bit on how their presence impacts uh, the way we train uh, uh, and equip for the air superiority flight? fight, which you talked a little bit about earlier. You bet. And so the, the J-20 is uh, China's premier aircraft, and so we're, we're studying that kind of quite closely. And the baseline, uh, as we train, the baseline threat, if you will, that we train to is um, based off of not only the J-20, but um, the J-10, the J-16, the J-11, and the weapons that they carry. And so that's what we train to. Um, and as I said earlier uh, in the interview, you know, we've gotten pretty good at countering those threats. And I, I've been impressed with the progress uh, that we've made. And of course, uh, the Chinese aren't done modernizing, uh, nor are we. And so as, as we move forward and they modernize and we modernize, we'll have to continue to adjust our tactics, techniques and procedures. And of course, Along the way, both sides will probably get new hardware and new software that will give more capability. And uh, like always, you have to adjust and um, be prepared for uh, the, the current threat to be able to um, counter it if you're called to do that. Sure. No, thanks for that. Um, related issue, but the fact of the matter is any high-end fight in the Pacific is going to involve far greater attrition rates than either the Air Force or the Navy, for that matter. Uh, have seen since the end of World War II. Um, are, are you considering or how are you dealing with the issue of attrition? Are you, are you planning on attrition factors as you think about the future? Yes, and I think before I get into answering your question, we go back to my opening comment, which is the overall objective is deterrence. And I, I we talked about integrated deterrence, but you know, let, let's just talk about why, why do we want deterrence anyway? You know, one is because do we really want to have this fight? No, I don't think China really wants to have this fight. They've said as much. Certainly Taiwan wouldn't want to have this fight. And so ultimately the, the overall goal is deterrence. And one of the main reasons is exactly what you just brought up, which is uh, the massive loss of life that would result from this fight. It, it's it's not the same as what um, America is accustomed to in the Middle East. Um, it's much more like what we experienced during World War II. And so the answer to your question is yes, we think about that um, in our planning and uh, we talk about it uh, frequently uh, with our folks and how, how to carry on and do mission command in the midst of attrition rates that Many of us haven't experienced, our grandparents did, um, but but we didn't. And so we, we have to think through how, how do you carry on your mission um, when when we have these kind of attrition rates. And, and so, yes, we do talk about it. And, you know, I, I would just opine deterrence, again, is the objective. And, and by the way, it should be China's objective, too. They have a hard time getting past their obsession over Taiwan. Yeah, no, thanks for that. I, just an observation, I had the privilege of uh, participating in the CSIS uh, series of war games in Taiwan, which was unclassified, which was nice, because we can talk about the outcomes. But just to reinforce what you just said, everyone who participates in that kind of a fight is a loser. Uh, or let me put it this way, stands to lose a lot. Yes. That's China, that's Taiwan, that's Japan, that's other allies, that's the United States. So just like you said, uh, we got to come up with some creative ways to deter uh, this from happening in the first place, because it, it's, it's, not a, it's not a pretty picture, which kind of takes us into my next question for you. And that's that uh, down the road, B-21s are going to be available to the PACAF commander and I I think that's kind of a big deal since the handful of B-2s that we have today can only be so many places at once. So could you talk a bit about the importance of gaining the B-21 for dealing and deterring potential 
uh, uh, contingencies with either China or North Korea. You bet. So you're exactly right. Well, one of the biggest advantages, I think, for the B-21 will be the numbers uh, and the number of aircraft that we're going to um, acquire uh, will help us. Um, but the, the pilot to vehicle interface uh, on that aircraft is a leap in capability compared to the B-2. And so the speed at which the crew can um, cycle through uh, the threats and then get weapons on target is a significantly faster um, and networked between uh, the B-21 formations that are out there that doesn't happen um, to the degree that we're going to see with the B-21 in the B-2. And so that advantage uh, will be um, will just it'll be a game changer uh, from the standpoint of being to get ordnance on targets um, faster at a rate that the, the that the enemy um, whoever that might be uh, will have a hard time responding to in a coherent way so that's uh, that's going to be um, the biggest the biggest advantage not to mention uh, the ability to to be even more stealthy than the b2 uh, and the other aspect that I'll bring out is, the aircraft was designed to be a daily flyer. Uh, and so what, what we mean by that is it's maintenance friendly. You can quickly repair it when it has a break uh, and get it back up in the air. And so you don't have extended periods of time where it's on the ground, but rather you have extended periods of time where it's in the air creating air power effects. And so between uh, the ability to have numbers, the the speed at which it can react to the threat, and the ability to keep it in the air are all going to be great advantages for the PACAF commander. Well, that's awesome that you bring that up because, you know, nothing against the B-2. It's been a wonderful airplane, but this is another generation. And part of the challenge with the B-2 was that flyability, if you will, or availability. Uh, so that that is an outstanding point. Would you go so far as to say that B-21s are going to act as nodes inside our sensor shooter complex, also known as ABMS, JADC-2? Sure, sure. I mean, because it's going to have fantastic sensors, and of course, it'll have lots of uh, uh, options for uh, weapons uh, to be employed, as well as other effects that it can create. Um, but of, of course, I mean, yeah. every single aircraft um, and many other things that aren't aircraft become nodes in uh, the ABMS, uh, in the ABS, yeah. ABMS family of systems that help us to uh, command and control air power as a part of the joint force, which then gets incorporated into joint all domain command and control, JADC2. Yeah, no, that's great to hear. Just as a bit of advertisement for Mitchell Institute. Um, uh, retired Colonel Mark Gunzinger just finished up uh, uh, a study on the relevance of the B-21 in the future. And we're going to be rolling that study out here in the not too distant future. Um, back to PACAF. The Philippines have been in the news recently um, with respect to some of the agreements that have been made. And most recently, we saw that um, there are a couple of F-22s yes. that paid a visit to Clark Air Base, yes. um, which brought back old memories, too, uh, dating myself. But, uh, uh, you know, a magnificent uh, place. Uh, could you talk a little bit about why this development of uh, increased partnership with the Philippines is so significant to you and our nation? You bet. Well, I appreciate you bringing up the F-22s uh, that were just there um, just about just over a week ago. Um, which was the first time that there have been any fifth gen uh, aircraft in the Philippines. And so that was great. And so you may have seen the, the photos of the team, the Philippine and the U.S. The team T-50s. on the ground. Yeah. Right. And they uh, did some interfly with some F-50s and uh, had had a great, uh, great, great subject matter exchange while they were on the ground. And so our hope is that we'll be able to do um, some more quick deployments like that uh, this year and the the agreement that the SecDef uh, concluded a few weeks ago um, allows more um, other joint players uh, to get into the Philippines over the next few years. Um, so that's uh, fantastic. But for the same reason that agile combat employment is a strategy of ours where we disperse the force and, and create uh, multiple um, 
you know, multiple dilemmas for anyone that wants to target our forces on the ground. Um, having more places to operate from uh, is an advantage. And um, certainly um, the Philippines would be a place where we'd be very interested in that. And so the, the coming year with uh, exercises and subject matter exchanges that we have uh, with the Philippine Air Force, I'm looking forward to, to seeing those um, go, uh, go down and then also to be able to expand uh, some of the uh, things that we're doing. Incidentally, um, this year's budget um, has uh, the 23 budget, not the, the upcoming 24 budget, but the 23 budget has um, um, fairly large funding for us to go back into Basa Air Base, which is where those F-50s are based, um, and do some airfield repair and expand uh, some of the ramp space uh, for mobility operations and, and the like. So um, we're looking forward to seeing that construction take place, and it gives us um, another place um, that we could potentially go, but um, our ally and partner has a better airfield to train as well, so that's uh, to our advantage in the end as well. Yeah, very good. Um, kind of on a related point, our current network of centralized basing obviously provides some operational efficiencies, but it also makes some big targets. Uh, in short, our force employment models are optimized for peacetime operations. What are your top concerns for actualizing Secretary Kindle's operational imperative on resilient distributed basing? Right. So that's the execution of Agile Combat Employment or ACE. And we are looking for as many airfields as we can um, have access to to disperse the force. And, and uh, one of the things that are in this year's budget, it was in last year's budget, it'll be hopefully in next year's budget is um, expanding airfields um, so that we can operate off of them. And so a lot of the budget money that we're spending this year is not to, to build permanent bases, but rather to expand runways that are not quite long enough to expand ramp space that aren't quite big enough for the number of aircraft that we'd like to place there and for fuel and munition storage and, and things like that. And so we're going to be doing that in a number of locations over the next several years. In addition to that, uh, we, we got funded uh, uh, several hundred million dollars for uh, pre-positioning of equipment, and so one of the one of the aspects of agile combat employment that's difficult to do is the logistics, especially logistics that's under attack. And so, our thought is is if we pre-position some of the equipment that we might need, especially in the early days of a potential conflict, um, you relieve. Um, some of that burden uh, to get logistics in there immediately. And so we're, we're already beginning to pre-position uh, a, no a number of equipment and supplies um, at places where we intend uh, to operate uh, from. And so uh, from the standpoint of construction, that's happening, pre-positioning, uh, that's happening. Um, I will tell you the State Department can help us out with more access spacing and overflight. And we've been talking to them and uh, there's a number of countries that are open to discussion uh, and letting us uh, come in and operate. Um, you know, certainly uh, Japan and Australia are fantastic agile combat employment partners. One, because they realize that they need to get good at agile combat employment as well. And so there's a great partnership between those two countries and, and that's going well. And then the last aspect of having resilient basing is what, you know, what happens when you get attacked. Um, particularly from ballistic missiles and hypersonic missiles, you have to be able to defend yourself and then also um, to repair the airfield uh, once it's damaged. And so uh, we are getting funding for rapid runway repair, and we have that um, placed out in a number of places. Uh, we'll be uh, purchasing some more capability to do that. But the base defense is something that I would, would have a concern about and um, sink a, an Army mission, as you know, uh, we've talked before about um, having the Army um, improve their capability and uh, and their capacity to be able to be in the places where we intend to base, um, particularly against maneuvering reentry vehicles and um, hypersonics. And so the, the Army is working on that, um, and we cannot get that capability fast enough. No, that's very good. Um, I'm also, as you're as you're speaking, I'm reminded of the fact that, um, you know, operating under attack is something that 
the United States Air Force has exercised and practiced for decades. Right. And so one of the advantages of land bases um, is with rapid runway repair, yeah, you might get attacked, but you can repair the runways and operate out of them in some cases, depending upon the degree of damage, in a matter of hours, not days or weeks or months or years in the case of uh, uh, other operating locations like aircraft carriers. Um, okay. Um, one of the things that you talked about in, in a lot was our partners and our allies. Um, can you talk a little bit about the changes that are ongoing with respect to our partners and allies and maybe things that they have planned uh, that could affect both our deterrence uh, perspective as well as adding combat power in the future? Well, I've already mentioned it a number of times, but uh, the agile combat employment um, is becoming more of a theme for more and more of our allies and partners, uh, mainly because they realize that with precision guided munitions, especially those that are proliferated um, to the extent that we see in, in our region, they realize that you're not going to be able to be based at a very large base um, because the, the base will get attacked and then all of your air power that's at that base will be stuck on the ground until you repair. And, and to your point about uh, repair, uh, it, if you haven't been able to see some of our capabilities, but uh, this, this quick drying concrete that we have, um, you pour it and it's, it's the consistency of a milkshake when it goes in the hole and 45 minutes later you can walk on it. Three hours later you can land a C-17 on it. So, it, I mean, it dries really fast. That's fast. So our allies and partners are very interested in this technology. And, of course, we're sharing sharing those um, capabilities with them. Um, they're also very interested in base defense, as we um, talked about earlier on a previous question. Um, they want to robust their capability to defend themselves as well. Um, and then bringing in... Uh, Non-kinetic effects is another aspect that our allies and partners are um, significantly interested in from the standpoint of electronic combat and, and cyber effects and then effects from space. In fact, um, the, the t topic of space effects um, is in almost every um, single meeting that I have with um, allies and partners. Um, and uh, of course, we have a significant advantage um, in space, and um, a lot of our allies and partners are interested in robusting um, their capabilities um, or or sharing with ours. And I will tell you that the the sharing of information is another topic that uh, when I talk with allies and partners, they're very interested in. And we've seen uh, what happens uh, uh, as an example in Europe when we expand our sharing agreements. Um, you know, with the um, with the partners in Europe, um, how how well things go, um, and I'm very interested in that in in the Pacific. And as a matter of fact, one one of the measures that I took this year, which I'm sure you've heard about, uh, but we have a relatively new deputy commander at PACAF, uh, which is Air Vice New Air Vice Marshal Newman. Uh, he's an Australian uh, two star. And uh, he's our deputy commander, which is the first time ever uh, that PACAF has had a, a foreign nation deputy commander. But um, it it speaks to our willingness to share with our partners and have them be a part of our um, organization. And it's a tremendous um, advantage for our headquarters to have um, his perspective. And um, he's uh, quite experienced all over the world and, and his experiences add a richness to our headquarters that I greatly appreciate. Oh, that's awesome. Um, you mentioned uh, Europe. Uh, before we move over to questions from the audience, uh, it's been just over a year mm -hmm. since Russia has invaded Ukraine. Uh, Two-part question. Um, what lessons do you think China's taking away uh, from the challenges and difficulties that Russia is having uh, part one and then part two, um, what lessons are you taking away from what's going on in Ukraine? Yes. So I, I hope that China is um, paying close attention and I assume that they are. But one, one, one first one that I think of is 
Uh, do you remember, I know you do, but I'm sure the audience I'll remind, some of the audience I'll remind of the information space that Russia tried to create before they invaded um, to rationalize this invasion. And they, they were making up facts uh, to try to give them that rationale that they, they would have some kind of legal authority to, to do this invasion. And of course, no one in the international community bought any of it. Um, and so the lies that they made up didn't work. So we're already starting to see some of that with uh, China in the context of Taiwan. Like the U.S. is trying to create uh, an Asian NATO or Taiwan is trying to uh, trying to be a, a sovereign nation or independent nation. You know, the people that are talking about it, that is China, not us, not the other nations in in uh, in the region, uh, but China. The second lesson that I hope that uh, China paid attention to is, you know, after uh, the conflict started in Europe, how did the world come together? And they initially came together with sanctions um, and, you know, and economic measures uh, to create costs for Russia. Um, and then eventually they uh, went to support and, and even as far as lethal aid, um, that all happened. And I think that China should expect a very similar response, you know, if they were um, to uh, attack their neighbor. Uh, and then the, uh, the probably the one that rings true mostly to airmen is the lack of air superiority and what happens when you don't have that. Um, so, in, you know, in in almost every circle, anybody that uh, more than a year ago, if you would have considered this invasion, you would have thought that Russia would have had an easy time uh, with with Ukraine, but they didn't. And I believe that one of the major reasons was because they they never did and still haven't established air superiority, um, which cost them so many lives. And when you think about the loss of life in this conflict, it's staggering. More than 100,000 uh, Russian uh, casualties, uh, which is just horrific I mean, if you look at it from the hum humanitarian si side of this. Um, and then the last, um, the last uh, lesson uh, that I hope uh, China learns is military as well, which is how easy Russia should have had it with a relatively easy operation, which is cross the border on land. Uh, China has the most difficult military operation there is to do, which is an amphibious landing coordinated with an air assault over 100 miles of ocean um, and then similar uh, uh, an adversary that would fight. And uh, and also just like Ukraine, you know, we 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 have seen a country that is determined to defend themselves in, in the discussions that I have with my counterparts. Uh, in Taiwan, they tell me, you know, they will be similar. Very good. How about key lessons that, other than the air superiority one uh, that you take away? So the air superiority one, air superiority one is uh, number one. for certain. Um, but logistics too. Uh, um, Russia hasn't done a great job of supplying um, their troops on the ground, um, and it's cost them dearly. And and so we've got to be. Um, paying attention to logistics. And, you know, that's probably one of the main reasons why I'm so close with General Minahan uh, and um, also General Van Ovost, um, because our our plan, if if we if we are called to execute this plan, requires logistics under attack. And you talked about it earlier um, over the tyranny of distance, uh, which is not an easy problem to solve. And um, agile combat employment, exactly the same thing of you, you, you can't do agile combat employment if you don't have good logistics. By the way, you can't do agile combat employment if you don't have good command and control. And so that's um, probably another lesson learned that as I watch, you know, what, what the what the Russians have been doing has been abysmal um, in the way of command and control and synchronizing joint fires, which is, um, from my view, doesn't seem like it's happening at all. Very good. Well, thanks very much for those insights, Cruiser. It's awesome. Let's uh, now kind of open the session up to questions from the audience. Um, I think everybody out there knows the drill. So when I call on you, if you've got your 
uh, hand raised, un unmute your mic, and then uh, let us know who you are and state your question. So we'll, we'll start right off the bat with uh, Robert Kraft. Robert, over to you. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Generals. I appreciate it. Can you hear me okay? We can hear you great. Okay, great. Uh, yeah, and also the Mitchell, Mitchell Institute. I'd like to thank them too and their entire team. Uh, thank you for all the work that you do. Uh, my question, uh, General, is I'm very interested in the, I think that the China is, their, their long-term goal is to do what America is doing. And they are, we like, for example, we sell in international waters just off the coast of China. We fly. And also, uh, I think that their interest is to do the same to us. And then what justification would we have if they're doing the same to us, say, off the coast of San Francisco or Los Angeles or Hawaii? I actually live on the flight path to Hickam. And whenever I see the, the fighters fly over my house, uh, I very much appreciate what you and your team do, uh, does for our freedom. So I'd like to hear your viewpoint about as China expands, um, and they have that kind of viewpoint, I believe, how would you react to that as they expand out into different areas near our coastlines? Thank you. Yes, thank you for your question. So let me challenge your question just to a degree, and it maybe was um, not in the same vein that you asked it, but I just wanted to just clarify because I actually don't believe that um, China wants to do the same thing that we do um, because we, we actually believe in a free and open Indo-Pacific, really we believe in a free and open, uh, open globe. What China actually wants to do is impose the CCP will, not only on their neighbors in the region, but they really wanna impose it uh, on everybody else. But uh, so that, let me just start with just one slight challenge to your question, um, but more militarily, I, I think you may be correct that they would love to be able to um, operate off the, the coast of uh, California. We occasionally see them operating their ships even near Hawaii. Uh, but I would contend that if as long as they do that in accordance with international law and international airspace and, uh, and also um, maritime space, uh, that we would be okay with that. Uh, obviously, we would react um, anytime they got close as they react um, to us. But, you know, when you see the recent occurrence of the balloon uh, flying across Alaska, Canada, continental U.S., um, you see how they absolutely don't respect um, our sovereign airspace or that of Canada's, and they don't fly in accordance with uh, international law every time either. Um, and so that, that would be the way that I would respond to you is as long as they comply with international law, uh, then we would have no problem because that's what we do when we're flying um, near their coast as we comply with international law. Okay, um, let me go to one from uh, the uh, chat room uh, from someone who you'll recognize, General Ron Keyes. All right. Hi, General Keyes. Who, who asks, what do you see as a support for the Pacific Defense Initiative going forward to improve Indo PACOM training? particularly ACE, readiness and in allied integration. You bet. So well, one of the things that I'd like to see with um, the Pacific Defense Initiative, PDI, um, is it to be more than just a paperwork drill. And, and what I mean by that is uh, when you compare it with um, what um, was EDI, the uh, European Defense Initiative, it was actually funds um, that were on top of um, the 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 budget. So it was funds that the UCOM commander could use on top. PDI is really just funds identified as funds that you would have spent already anyway, um, but that are applied to um, the Pacific, which in the, the this year's budget and what we think is going to be the next year's budget um, is a significant increase uh, from prior years, and we're greatly appreciate appreciative of the um, those um, th that money so and we'll put it to, to good use um, and and the, the uses that we want to 
put it to good use is one of the things that you addressed in your question, which which is um, exercises, especially with allies and partners. But um, we we received um, a considerable increase um, last year and this year. Um, to be able to increase the uh, frequency, especially from the Air Force standpoint, but really all the services did, uh, to increase the frequency of our operations and activities that are significant well, west, west of the dateline, um, particularly. And uh, you would have noticed that if you were closely paying attention to the number of uh, deployments that we sent out, to, as an example, to Kadena and Guam. Um, and then the other services, uh, just the same, they're, they're operating at an increased rate in uh, last year, this year, and then we expect um, next year as well. Okay, great. Let's uh, go back to our live audience. How about uh, Frank Wolf? Frank? Hi there, uh, General. Um, I just had a question. I was interested just in your um, remarks on the B-21 um, in terms of uh, being ready to fly every day, and I wondered how is uh, how is PACAF going to, going to achieve that or, or your ideas going forward? For that, um, and if you've drawn any lessons uh, from from F thirty five sort of O and M, um, I I guess that again the PACAF has a pretty good uh, mission capable rate in terms of F thirty five, given that it's a forward command. But I think back uh, sort of the the back back shop. I think there's there's obviously there've been some questions on, uh, in the past, obviously on, on F thirty five mission capability rates uh, for the non cocons but um, I just wanted to see the steps you're taking or plan to take to ensure that the B-21 is going to have a, a ready-to-go availability, and uh, if you had any uh, thoughts on that. Yeah, it's a bit early, just uh, since the aircraft hasn't quite flown yet, but um, I think that uh, I'm, I'm very confident that um, industry is uh, learning the lessons uh, over time, so if you think back to the F-117, then the F-22, then the F-35, and the B-2, and now the, now the B-21, each generation of those aircraft become easier and easier to maintain, um, and particularly the low observable aspect of the aircraft uh, becomes easier and easier to do. I mean, let's face it, if, if you buy an F-35 or you buy a, a B-21 that doesn't retain its low observable, you're paying a lot of money for essentially, you know, what is an F-16 or a B-1 or a, B, a B-52. It's a non-stealthy um, aircraft. And so the, the low observable aspect um, is incredibly important. And, and I, I, I know for a fact that uh, the F-35 as well as the the B-21 were designed to be easier on the maintainer um, to retain that low observability. And so we'll, we'll obviously um, be um, thinking about um, that. Um, you're right. Our F-35s uh, that uh, we have in theater are enjoying an incredible maintenance reliability rate, you know, even in the harsh Alaska winter, uh, which is uh, still occurring, even though it's looking to be springtime uh, here in the the in the in the lower 48 uh, and so uh, we will um, look to um, hopefully enjoy that um, with the b21 as well but as we think about how we intend to employ the b21 here in theater is we we will um, obviously not um, base that aircraft real close in but rather in a place where um, sustainability uh, will not be um, as difficult as if you you had it at a close close in base um, and it'll be in a place where um, logistics uh, would not necessarily be under attack. And so that'll um, allow us to um, keep the aircraft in the air. Okay, how about uh, Kimberly Underwood? Hi, sir. Can you hear me? We can hear you great. Uh, thank you so much for your time this morning. And I always um, love listening to you guys speak. I feel like I learned so much. Um, General Vilsbaugh, can you talk about your efforts with Australia, especially with airmen being stationed, it seems more and more in Australia. Obviously, you have very close ties with the country, and you mentioned kind of the work you're, you'll be doing with them, or they'll help be helping you with the E7. But what are your plans, I guess, for maybe the rest of the summer, or you know, going into FY24 with improving your ties with Australia? Thank you. You bet. Well, it's tough to improve the uh, the ties with Australia because it's uh, such a good relationship uh, to begin with. But um, 
I was just uh, down in Australia a few weeks ago at the Avalon Air Show. And, you know, often when people talk about air shows, they, they think of the uh, static displays and the aerial displays. And, and those things certainly happened at the, at the Avalon Air Show. Um, but when you're a MATCHCOM commander or an air chief, uh, what air shows mean to you is getting together with your counterparts from the other countries uh, that are there. And so I actually saw very few of the static displays, and I think I only saw one um, aerial display, which was the F-22, which impressed everybody. Uh, but uh, I would tell you that what I spent my time at um, the Avalon Air Show doing was uh, meeting with our Australian counterparts for sure, but also um, a number of the other air chiefs uh, that came in from, from all over the world. And it's a fantastic opportunity uh, for us uh, to get together and talk about areas of mutual interest as well as to make plans uh, for the coming year on, and not just this year, but um, in, in subsequent years uh, to work together and to improve the relationship and to, to really um, zero in on, um, on Australia. One, one area um, that I mentioned earlier uh, was the E-7. And so uh, Air Marshal Chipman, who's the, the Air Chief of the Royal Australian Air Force, um, has already offered uh, to the U.S. Air Force to help us bring the E-7 on. And the offer is that um, U.S. The air crew will um, go to Williamtown uh, RAF base uh, and begin training on the E-7, the, the Australian E-7, so that when hours are delivered, uh, we have crews that are that are already trained. You know, and that's a great example of partners uh, working together. They have a several year. Um, advantage um, of operating that aircraft uh, compared to us, and so that will be a significant advantage. And of course, um, the F-35 um, interaction that we have with Australia is extremely strong, and we're continuously um, comparing um, tactic techniques and procedures and uh, uh, for the ops side of the house, but also um, with regard to maintaining um, that that aircraft and there's a number of uh, weapons programs that we can't talk about on this unclassified line that uh, we're collaborating with and then we really look forward to um, what they're doing with the mq-28 ghost bat um, they're uh, what we call it a com uh, combat a collaborative combat aircraft cca um, they um, they are doing some great work um, figuring out exactly how to use this aircraft and uh, we look forward to uh, seeing what they learn and then perhaps um, applying that to our CCA program ourselves. Um, well, that's great. Uh, interesting last comment that you have there. Uh, and let's finish up with one quick question from Caitlin Lee, um, who is our director of unmanned uh, aerial aircraft as well as uh, autonomy here. That's John Wilsbach. What are your most urgent operational needs? Number one. Number two, do you see a role? For autonomous drones and meeting some of those needs. Yeah, so my I talked about our most urgent operational need, which is the basis of you know warfare, which is if you don't have air superiority, the rest of your objectives are at extreme risk. Uh, so that that's our that's our operational risk, and uh, and we're getting after that. And so I'm I'm, I'm very happy with. Uh, the budgeting that we've seen over the last few years the, to address that with um, F-15EX and E-7 and additional F-35s and continue with the NGAD family of systems. And so those are all, um, and, and the weapons uh, that help us with all of that um, are all in the budget. I'm, 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 ha I'm uh, definitely happy with that. But uh, for the un unmanned systems, absolutely. I mean, you can take risk with an un unmanned system that you would not want to take with a manned uh, system. Um, but with, with this uh, collaborative combat aircraft, CCAs, and we, we heard the secretary um, a few days ago at AFA talk about um, wanting to have a thousand of those. Um, th those are dilemmas that your adversary has to deal with. And imagine if they had to deal with a thousand additional uh, combat aircraft that can do m multiple things. They can be sensors, they can be weapons platforms, they can be decoys, they can be jammers. They, they can do a lot of different things. And you can put them in places that you would not want to put a man platform because um, if you... If it got shot down, you would have to either you would have a loss or you would have to go rescue them, which is another risk that you would have to take on. 
And so the, the ability to create dilemmas and mass up um, those dilemmas on your adversary uh, cause them to make mistakes, uh, it causes them to use weapons, and it eventually will cause them uh, to lose their assets in versus us. Well, very good. And uh, General Wilsbach, thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks, General. Uh, uh, from Mitchell Institute, here. yeah, we wish you all the best in your future endeavors. Thank you. And to everybody in the audience, have a great aerospace power kind of day.